Um, hi, everybody. It's great to be here today. Um, I just want to start off with a shout out and thanks to our funders and supporters and point out specifically that uh, two of our funders, Historic Scotland and the uh, Heritage Lottery Fund, really are very closely related to the targets and deliverables of the project, both on the heritage side and on the community and outreach side. So just to introduce who we are, we're SCAPE, the organisation that runs SHARP. We're set up in 2000 as a response by Historic Scotland to the recognition that coastal erosion was really causing a, a, a problem, it was a serious threat to the archaeological heritage of the Scottish coast. So we work with the public on the archaeology of Scotland's coast, in particular the archaeology that's being impacted by coastal processes. So the Scotland's Coastal Heritage at Risk project really is a natural progression of our philosophy of working with the public on coastal archaeological research and management. So just to start off by having a quick look at the heritage that we work with, of course I don't need to tell this audience, um, <coughs> Scotland's coastal area has always been a very favoured location for settlement, largely due to geography and access to natural resources and so on. But that does mean that we have this issue of our cultural heritage um, under threat from erosion, exacerbated by issues of climate change, sea level rise, increased storminess and so on. So the heritage that we deal with can be broadly categorised into two main areas. First is mostly prehistoric sites which weren't originally on the coast but which are now being impacted by coastal processes. Um, largely as a result of isostatic <coughs> rebound following the end of the last ice age and uh, the uh, sort of relative sea level rise that particularly affects the Northern Isles and the Western Isles, uh, which have a sea level rise um, curve more analogous to what you've got in the south of England, for example. We also have a lot of cultural heritage which um, is, is, is specifically to do with the coast, coastal infrastructure, fishing, uh, industries and so on, which was built at the coast edge but is now redundant, it's no longer being maintained so it's being destroyed by these coastal processes. So as a result of that we have thousands of our coastal archaeological sites at risk of loss. Um, so the data that we deal with under the Scotland's Coastal Heritage at Risk project um, came from a series of professional coastal zone assessment surveys funded by Historic Scotland. These recorded 12,500 sites in the 40% of the coast that they um, covered. This data was refined through a prioritisation process and because the, the issues aren't going to go away, the problem's only going to get worse, so we really needed to do something about the issue. So that's really the, the context to SHARP. Of course, we're not working in a vacuum. It builds on SCAPE's core philosophies, and there are also a lot of great projects out there who we've been working with and who we've collaborated on in the, in the project design. So um, this is really what Sharp's all about. Uh, we are asking volunteers to go out, update the records of the original coastal zone assessment surveys uh, with training and support from us. And the follow-up to that is community-led action at a selection of those sites that the communities are particularly interested in. Uh, as part of the project, we made sure that we'd have the resource to take action at, at, at some of these sites nominated by local communities. Because I think it's quite important to actually do something at sites uh, both in terms of the heritage but also in terms of widening participation from the community. So this has all been about using community values to target the limited pot resources we do have, using community value to prioritise sites for further work. So uh, just to speak quickly about the first aspect of the SHARP project, um, SHORE update, this is where we took the Coastal Zone Assessment Survey data, made it accessible, put it on a website with an interactive site risk map, the objective being to update and improve the data. The, as, as with any data, there were issues with the Coastal Zone Assessment Survey data. They were rapid, they weren't designed to be in depth, and they weren't designed to capture local knowledge. So it had a lot of potential as a resource, but it really wasn't being realised. Crowdsourcing was an, was an obvious uh, step to take, given our philosophy. Uh, we wanted to engage people, involve them, give them a say in their coastal heritage and bring in that, that wider knowledge and experience into the data as well. So it's all about transforming the data and something people cared about to efficiently up improving and updating our data and really making the transition from data collection into data as, as a management tool. So uh, we put our uh, records on this interactive map. People can then access the data and then from there access the interactive uh, pages of the website where they can submit their records, submit photos and um, the information that, that they feel is relevant for us to know. So when we were designing these surveys it was very important to ask the right questions. Uh, we made sure that we 
worded the question to really to capture the information that we wanted to help us widen our criteria of value and significance. Uh, we've also been able to take advantage of the technology out there, which really has enabled us to put the data into a map, because phones these days are GPS, a camera, maps, notebooks, and that's really given us the opportunity to open the data up and um, widen access to the community. Of course, all of this is backed up with extensive investment um, in, in terms of our time to travel, work with volunteers, give them training, support them, go on field trips with them, record coastal sites with them and really build their confidence. I really think you, you can't overestimate the, the importance of this. Um, there's also a lot of training and, uh, and support in terms of when you go back to the office and um, being a, a point of contact and answering questions and moderating the data that the volunteers uh, submit. It's really about starting a dialogue, having that face-to-face -face contact and um, building a relationship with people because people have information but in order to get it you need to have a relationship with them. Uh, that's all backed up with online guidance. We've got a suite of training videos just to introduce people to how to use the website and the, and the app as well. So volunteers are generating data which is going to be used for management and, and for further archaeological research. And we've also built a network of coastal heritage uh, volunteers who are boots on the ground to go and monitor the change to sites in this sort of very dynamic environment. So um, this is where we are with the project. Uh, we're just at the end of our third year, so we're largely fin finished the data collection. And it really is the volunteer data that's going, to, that's going into the documents that are going to come out of the project. So we're going to have um, a, a <coughs> statement of the coastal archaeological resource to a national level, a series of national priorities, local priorities and local action plans. And I think it's really important that those documents uh, actually acknowledge the very valuable contribution that the volunteers have made, because it is their data, data they've generated, that's going into these documents. So we're also going to link to national strategies and to uh, the national research framework as well. So there's a very serious aspect to this, this output as well. So just to give you some, some numbers as, as to uh, the levels of engagement, both on the community side and on the, on the heritage side that we've achieved with the project, and uh, also to say that, of course, Citizen, who I know there's a lot of you in this room, are also applying this, pro the, this approach because it, it works. So quickly, uh, the second part of our project, Shore Digs, this is all about the community-led action at the coastal sites. Uh, we've done a range of site types and a range of projects. What they have in common is they've all been nominated by the community. There have been various scales. There have been excavation, survey, video-making projects, digital interpretation. Some are quite substantial projects in their own right. So I'm just going to give you a couple of case studies. Um, this is one example. This is Loch Fleet in uh, East Sutherland. This is a fleet of herring fishing boats, um, which was completely unrecorded until a team of shore update surveyors stumbled across it during a, a, a walk to update some, some records a couple of years ago. This was completely unrecorded. Uh, although there were once thousands of these vessels in the Scottish fishing fleet, survivors can be counted on the fingers of one hand. There's four of these boats left. And in terms of the archaeological record, they were completely absent. They hadn't been recorded at all. So there's been a lot of great archaeological research. On, um, there's been a lot of great his historical research into this history, but there's been really no, no recording done. So we collaborated closely with the NES on this project and on a similar one um, in, in Fintorn on the Murray Coast. We, we also did extensive oral history and, and local history research to put the uh, history of the fishing into context and tell the story of the communities associated with them. Tried a few new innovative recording techniques to record this type of heritage. And in the end, thanks to volunteers, we got a really good record of something that had been completely unrecorded prior to that. Then a completely different uh, type of project we've been involved in. This is Muirburg Mound on Sandy in Orkney. Uh, this was a site the community came to us. It, the, the site had already been excavated, but what they wanted was to rescue the site from the beach where it was being impacted by the winter storms every year, it was being destroyed. They wanted to move the site and reconstruct it at their village, at their um, heritage centre on the island. So this is a site that had already been excavated, it had been published, there was a perception it, it had been dealt with, but when we re-excavated it, we discovered a well that was uh, contemporary with the burnt mound and then actually underneath the tank of the burnt mound an earlier well, Neolithic or, or early Bronze Age. Both of these wells had 
incredible organic preservation at the bottom of them, so there's great environmental potential in there as well. And uh, we had a great response from the local community. I think everybody in the island was involved in this project in some capacity. And because we relocated the Burnt Mound to the Islands Heritage Centre, they've now got a tourist attraction, so the island's been left with that legacy as well. Uh, there is a, another site, an unrecorded flying boat base, Second World War flying boat base near Strindrar. We did an archaeological condition survey as part of that. But uh, when we were doing uh, local history research, we realised there was a great resource of knowledge and information about this site in the local community. So it's a great opportunity to do something with this resource. So we worked with local young people to make a film about the base, introduce them to their heritage, and work with older people in the community who actually remember the base in use. Um, finally, uh, we've got Weems Caves in Fife. This is a series of six sea caves on the South Fife coast. <coughs> They're full of carvings, most of which are Pictish. Uh, they actually the, are the largest uh, collection of Pictish carvings in Scotland. Um, and although it's this extremely valuable, important heritage, it's very vulnerable not only to coastal erosion, also to landslip, neglect, vandalism, and just decay because of the degradation of the stone of the cave walls that carvings were cut into. So in this case, we applied a series uh, of uh, digital data recording techniques. Uh, we also did, again, local history research to find out about the history of the use of the caves in the community and the change in the coast. And uh, we've combined those two to share the really great digital record that we got out of it online with a, with a global audience. So again, just to show you some overall statistics about the project as a whole, I think the, the most important <coughs> thing is that the heritage, the heritage we're dealing with, it really needs the community. There's a very urgent need because of the threats this heritage is facing. Um, the, the volunteer input, it does need training, it needs a lot of support. It's not an easy or a, or a cheap option, but not only is it about eyes on the ground to monitor these sites, it's also really important to, to realise that the data the volunteers are generating really goes towards very serious and very important outputs um, in terms of archaeological research and as a, as a management tool for the future. And I think it's really important for the volunteers to know that their contribution is valued in that way. And uh, sometimes if you're lucky and build a good relationship with the community, they make you cakes. <laughs>